Thank you for the lovely introduction. Uh, so as it was stated, my talk is titled Aggressive Children Preventing Victimization of Others in Adulthood. And I'm gonna go into what I mean by that exactly because in essence we're talking about criminality later on in adult life. So just to give you a bit of an idea of what I plan to cover today, I'm gonna go over my background, some of which will be familiar from the talks that you've seen already uh, throughout the course of the conference. The methods, my analyses, which I'm going to include a model, and I'm going to also talk a little bit about some statistics that I use that are a little bit different than what we're used to. And then I'm going to go over my results and my future directions and implications. So we got a lovely introduction to the Bronfenbrenner model with the keynote talk yesterday. And so just to remind everybody, the model talks about how several influences can impact the developing child. In particular, the overarching reason I'm using this model and the question in general for my talk today is how do these factors uh, lead to victimization in adulthood of others or criminality? In terms of my talk today, I plan to focus on two main factors in the microsystem. This is the peers and the school. In terms of peers, as we've observed already through the, con the conference, we see that there are several types of bullying. And under bullying, we have s different types of aggression as well, aggressive behavior. Verbal aggression, dating violence, relational aggression, and aggressive behavior towards peers. That is what I'm gonna be focusing on today in terms of my analyses and my results. In terms of aggressive behavior towards peers being a risk factor, it has been associated with poor relationships, including relationships with peers and teachers. And there's two uh, ways that this manifests. The first is that being an aggressive child means that you're more likely to associate with similarly aggressive children. And this exacerbates the effect of uh, the aggressive behavior and the risk factor. In addition to this, being an aggressive child means that you're less likely to have positive relationships with both your peers and your teachers. Aggression in childhood has also been associated with less education, so less years of schooling. And there's a well-established relationship that aggression in childhood predicts later criminal offending in adulthood, specifically violent crime. But that's not the whole picture. One of the things that the Bronfenbrenner model can sort of remind us of is that there's both protective factors and risk factors. And in terms of my questions today, it's kind of asking, why is it that some aggressive children go one route and other aggressive children go a more positive route. So in terms of factors at the peer level, in terms of protection, I'm going to be looking at likability. So being liked by your peers has some positive outcomes, including being associated with less physical aggression. In addition to that, people who are liked or children that are liked by their peers have also shown better mental health outcomes. And there's also this uh, body of literature sh demonstrating that positive peer relationships or being liked by your peers uh, is associated with more years of schooling. In terms of the other level within the, or the other factor in the Bronfenbrenner microsystem, schooling, we can see that education may play an important role in the developing child, for the developing child. Higher education has been associated with positive outcomes, including healthier lifestyles, personal family and community well-being, and there's a strong uh, evidence for education reducing criminality later on in adult life. So the more years of education you have, the less likely you are to commit a crime. Reading about this uh, literature got me thinking about some of the methodological problems that I encountered. The first is that if you wanted to establish a, that a risk factor predicts an outcome, what would you do with the protective factors that seem to reduce that effect later on in, in the course? Would you control for education, for example, as a protective factor? Or would you use education as an intervening or protective variable? Many researchers would actually just control for education as a factor that they need to sort of partial out of the equation because they want to establish that aggression predicts crime. For the purpose of my talk today, I am using education as a protective variable or intervening variable. A second methodological problem that I came across, and again, Bronfenbrenner model, Bronfenbrenner's model got me thinking about why certain uh, research tends to focus on 
only risk factors or only protective factors? Why not examine both in the same model? That's also going to be the focus of my analyses today. My two research questions that stem from uh, these thoughts were that, can education protect above and beyond aggressive behavior to reduce criminal offending? And can being liked by peers, regardless of aggressive behavior, also be protective for these children? In terms of my hypotheses, my first one was that we would see a continuity of behavior. <clears throat> Excuse me. That aggressive behavior in childhood directly predicts criminal charges in adulthood. My second hypothesis was that education would be protective for these aggressive children. My third hypothesis was that being liked by peers is also protective in that it will predict more years of education. In terms of my methods, I had a sample of 3,552 participants from the Concordia Longitudinal Research Project. It's a little under half being male. In terms of my measures, I have aggression likability, which I was used, uh, sorry, the pupil evaluation inventory was used. And this is a peer nomination survey or measure where each child nominates four boys and four girls that have statements on uh, aggressive, aggressive behavior or likability. For example, a statement under aggressive behavior would be something like, he or she is cruel to others. And they would have to nominate four people in their class, male and female, that uh, meet those statements. Same thing for likability. Then those scores were summed and uh, adjusted or standardized for age, sex, and classroom. In terms of education, we used government database diploma records, so not self-report. We got these diploma records from the government, and these were converted into years of education. In terms of criminal charges, these are binary outcomes, so zero meaning no charge, and one meaning you have a charge. And these are also public database records, so not self-report. The frequency of charges in the sample that I have are similar to what we would find in the population. And you see that there's about a 10 to 1 ratio between males and females. And that is also as we would expect. In terms of the timeline for my analyses or for my measures, we have aggression and likability in between 1976 and 1978. And the children were about between 7 and 13 years old. Education was collected around 2006, and criminal charges 2010. In terms of my analyses, I use a path model using causal mediation based on counterfactuals. And this generates odds ratios for causally defined effects. In addition to this, I use some interaction terms to test moderation. This was my schematic path model. So as you can see here on the left, we have aggression and likability predicting both both of them predicting education, and they're also directly predicting violence, property, and drug charges. Education is also direct, directly predicting violence, property, and drug charges. Now, before I get into some statistics lingo, by a show of hands, who has heard of causal mediation based on counterfactuals? <laughs> Three or four people? Okay, so just briefly, I'm going to tell you why it's important to think about mediation in a different way, because in my data, for example, I have what is called a zero-inflated distribution. And what you see is that for violence charges, males on the left, females on the right, you see a lot of zeros and not very many ones. That is what we would expect, actually, and that is also the case in the population. Now, when you do normal mediation, it actually will estimate the outcome so if you do A by B mediation, it'll estimate a continuous outcome. And that's a problem when you have binary data that looks like this. So if I impose normal distributions on these uh, frequencies, we can see that there's a lot of white space. And that is why I have chosen to do the causal mediation based on counterfactuals, because it maintains the binary nature of the outcome. And that is why we get odds ratios for the effects. Okay? There are two effects that we get. One is the direct effect. And essentially what it is, it's the effect from the predictor to the outcome as if there was no effect to the mediator or no path to the mediator. So using my variables, I would expect that if I have high aggression, 
I would expect an odds ratio greater than one for criminal offending, any of the three charges. Then there's also the indirect effect or the mediation effect, and it acts pretty much the same way that we would expect with a normal product mediation, but as I stated earlier, it maintains the binary nature. So again, using my variables, what I would expect is if I had highly aggressive children, I would expect lower education, which in turn predicts an odds ratio greater than one. So just to recap my hypotheses after that statistics uh, lesson, we have continuity of behavior, education is protective, and that being liked by peers predicts more years of education. So here are my results, and it's quite busy, but bear with me. On the left in black, you have males, and on the right in reddish color, you have, it's not very distinguishable, but on the right you have females. Both of the models for male and female were excellent fit. You can see the fit indices here at the bottom. This model also controlled for age, uh, childhood withdrawal, neighborhood disadvantage, and mental health status. And what you see is for my first hypothesis, we see this continuity of behavior. So childhood aggression predicts an increased probability of violence, property, and drug charges for both males and females. Now we want to go to jump a little bit to the mediation, where we see, again, we get our two direct, uh, uh, sorry, our two effects in the causally defined uh, model. So again, the direct effect and the indirect effect are both generated with odds ratios. And what you see here for males is that for every increase in aggression, there's a 62% increased probability in violence charges. And this sort of pattern holds for property and drug charges as well, albeit at a little lower uh, probability. Now, the indirect effect, so again, that path passing through education, what we see is a reduction of almost 50%, actually it is 50% for violence charges. Okay. We see a similar pattern for property charges and drug charges. To further elaborate on this point, I tested the moderation. So aggression by education for both males and females. What we see is that we have low aggression here on the left, high aggression on the right, and probability of a violence charge on the y-axis. Our highest risk group are those with high aggression and low education. And then we see our protected group, those with high aggression, but also somehow manage to get a high education, are protected to the point where they're similar to low aggressive peers' counterparts. In terms of my third hypothesis, likability we can see, as expected, positively predicts more years of education. But is that the only thing happening? So I attested again using causally defined effects, the indirect path from likability to uh, violence, property, and drug charges. What we find is that there's no direct effect from likability or being liked by others to the criminal charges. And this is for both males and females. However, for males, what we find is there's a significant indirect effect for both violence, property, and drug charges. So what this means is that there was a complete mediation for males where being liked by peers leads to more years of education, which leads to less criminal offending in adulthood. What does this all mean? Staying in school has a bigger role than just providing increased financial opportunity. So in criminology and sociology, one of the arguments is that higher education leads to less crime because they have increased financial opportunities. <laughs> but education seems to be doing something else. Education is protective for both boys and girls with aggressive behavior. Education and other protective factors should not always be used solely as control variable. Likeability increases years of education for both males and females. For males in particular, being liked demonstrated this complete mediation. Being liked by your peers meant more years of education, which meant a reduction in criminal offending. Being liked by your peers is important for both males and females. In terms of future directions, in terms of my projects, I plan to look at things that will help uh, us to understand this educational attainment. Why are these kids going to school longer? How can we help pr to predict that? So determining both risk and protective factors. I also want to examine whether there are differential trajectories for violent and nonviolent offenders. 
There's a book by Savage and Wozniak, published very recently, that starts to examine or talk about the theoretical reasonings behind why we may have what they call thugs and thieves. So why do some offenders go on to commit violent crimes? And why do other uh, people or children grow up to have nonviolent crimes, such as dr drug or property charges? In some ways, this is parallel to the differences in bullying patterns, because we can s see or try start to understand that there are different trajectories uh, over time for these children that start off with many risk, but also protective factors. In terms of implications for bullying behavior, and I think one of the things that's coming across very strong at this conference is that we need to target strengths like education, peer relations, and reduce a focus on aggressive behaviors, reduce a focus on punitive measures. We need to promote positive peer interactions, and as researchers, we need to think of this from a more holistic approach. This is a several facet problem, and we need to think of it like that. In addition, we also need to understand that there appears to be different mechanisms for both males and females. So I will leave you with a question. How can we keep at-risk children from being aggressive to others presently, but also as they grow up to become adults? Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to make a reflection or ask a question? Yeah, I will come with the microphone for you. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm just a bit uncertain about the term victimization. Could you just explain that term? Please? Yeah, so victimize, victimization of others in adulthood. What I mean is that um, in terms of my, this specific study, it means criminality. So uh, when you commit a crime, violent crime, property crime, uh, drug crime, you are creating victims. So you are victimizing others in, a, in adulthood. I think we have, yeah, one more question for now. Maybe I can make my way in here. Thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, <clears throat> I wonder, uh, is it possible to see, um, to, divide, to differentiate between what kind of friends you are liked by? Because if they are very antisocial, then I think it would make a difference. That, uh, so I think it would be good to, to make, differentiate what kind of friends they are, what kind of attributes they have and things. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the points that I mentioned uh, earlier on is that Aggressive children will associate with other aggressive children. Maybe they're liked by those peers, and so that in itself might be, in some ways, an exacerbating risk factor. So you're absolutely right in the sense that not always the likability that we consider positive or being liked by peers is not necessarily always going to be a protective factor. And so that popularity piece is also important. And I would love to make that distinction um, thinking about my data currently, I'm not sure how I would tackle that, but it is definitely something that I want to consider because 100% popularity and being liked by your peers in both an antisocial and a positive context are two completely different things.